yep. get us official on here mm -hmm. and start out with some some housekeeping um new news for elco students uh, sad thing unfortunately we were slated to go to the new school of design in san diego as a field trip on friday and due to transportation issues it just got canceled out the bus got canceled and we don't have a way to go there so we we will be rescheduling that and we are trying to reschedule it for may 13th so everybody slated to go on that trip on friday this friday know that it has been i'm going to say postponed not canceled um rescheduled rescheduled monica rico which has been doing a great job getting this all together is going to send notification to everybody tonight and then we'll turn around tomorrow when we've got confirmation of the new date and time and all of that but no if you're on the call now and we're planning on going it has been postponed from this friday okay and then on another great piece of uh new news i'm going to ask mark eber to um talk about an exciting event happening on campus that uh, you all should also become involved with. So I'm going to let him take it from there and share. You're going to get more news about it, notification, but Mark, give it to us. Thank you, Ruben. Hi, um, I'm Mark Eber. Um, for those that don't know me, I am one of the instructors here. Um, Stephen, like you, um, my other role is urban designer. So um, anyways, uh, we are doing, um, and Stephen, actually this, we're considering seeing if you wanna be involved in this. Um, we are, um, are hosting an exhibition, an interactive exhibition and roundtable discussion on the design of the campus's outdoor spaces, or the, I should say the lack of. Um, our students, uh, we have presentations or we have uh, uh, proposals, design proposals coming from two different classes on how to, how to view these spaces as important components towards student success. And the exhibit will be held at the library um, starting May 5th, will run through May 19th. Um, we will start, we will launch the exhibition with a reception on the 5th at four o'clock. This is a Thursday. And we will close it out on the 12th with a roundtable discussion that will include outside design experts, faculty, staff, and students to talk about um, how these spaces can support equity, inclusion, and student success. Um, uh, the interactive part is, um, when you are at this at the exhibition, there'll be QR codes, and those QR codes will lead you to a survey to give feedback on your values and priorities in terms of what you think is important uh, to be on campus. We will take all this information, our proposals, the discussion, the input, and we will roll it into a proposal that should impact or should influence master uh, master plan uh, efforts moving forward. Um, and then also too, for those that don't make it to campus, um, we are going to be pushing the QR code via um, social media. And you'll uh, the, so everyone will have access to it, whether they're on campus or not, whether they come to the exhibit or not, they'll have a chance to have their say. Um, and um, we're really excited that, we have the upper leadership involved in this project, including the president, um, who will be making opening remarks during the roundtable discussion, um, and potentially board of trustees are going to be in the audience. So um, it's going to be exciting. You're going to see all, you're going to be flooded with all sorts of interesting um, uh, flyers, uh, information. Um, and questions about this to engage as many of you as possible. So please um, keep an eye out for it and talk about it and get your friends to your fellow classmates 
students to get them involved um, in the process. The more information we have, the more focused we can um, uh, uh, dictate or, or funnel our uh, efforts into the master plan for the campus. Is that master plan being um, executed now or is it something that's down the line? It'll probably be down the line. The last master plan was 2010. I don't know if there is a an ongoing master plan effort, but nonetheless, I was asked um, by the VP of Academic Affairs um, to put a proposal so that we can start thinking about how these spaces should be designed uh, when we do the next master plan, which it, this could trigger the next master plan. Yeah, well, I'll say a few things, if you don't mind, I'll offer some sure. feedback. Uh, because um, I'll be in Alabama on the 5th and Detroit on the 12th, so I'm kind of out. <laughs> but, um, you know, the open space is the literally the connective tissue that ties together the architecture. Yes. Um, and it's the first thing that's experienced before you get to the architecture. Right. And in this era of uh, awakened consciousness about how different groups of people react and respond to different kinds of spaces, the sensitivity around uh, what does equitable space kind of look like and feel like, uh, what does inclusive space look like and feel like, are definitely considerations that up until recently have not gotten uh, the kind of attention that they are certainly getting now. Right. And when you think about it, um, there are some shapes that are non-hierarchical, like circular space or ovular space, um, elliptical, but ultimately it's what happens inside of those spaces, within those spaces that will create an identity that people, students, faculty, administration will understand and begin to relate to uh, in a certain way which is to say that if a space is conceived in a way that it's for gathering and then it's programmed so that a diverse group of activities or diverse group of people presenting things uh, becomes associated with it, then that starts to create that identity and that students and, and campus users understand that's sort of where you go for this or that. Right. And so I think that it's, as architects focused on buildings, we often, uh, don't give ample consideration to that space in between. And so I think it's a, um, it's a great uh, way to involve your students in thinking about those things and then in informing uh, what might be going on with that master plan. So. Yeah, and how this came about, um, Stephen, was um, uh, the campus is moving towards being designated as a guided pathway campus. Mm. And um, during a summit, a student, during a student panel uh, part of the summit, mentioned they, that there was, um, she felt there was a lack of community at El Camino. And funny enough, I, had, I started off my, my tenure here at El Camino with this particular exercise. This was just before the pandemic hit. And then I returned to it this semester once we're back on campus and a light bulb went off and said, well, that's exactly what, that's what I thought. And that's why I did this exercise. And, and, and the whole idea is if we're gonna talk about student success, then we need to look at how design can play a role in that. And um, so that's how this kind of manifested itself. And um, so, yeah, so we're, you know, we're looking at spaces that have very, you know, we're looking for, um, uh, uh, student input to help us understand how to program these spaces because there's different needs, right? You know, we we want areas of quiet contemplation and we want areas of interaction and connection and everything in between, right? And so we need to just we need to we need to figure out well where are those priorities? What are the values and the priorities? And then design these spaces accordingly. You know, one of the things is, and I don't know if you've been on campus recently, they are the two new buildings are coming online and I thought it was really odd the way they cited them because they turned their side to the library and the library is sort of if you look at the library the library is a nucleus of any campus college campus of social you know all sorts of activity and yet it's sort of a dead zone outside and the library recognizes and they're trying to compensate it with all sorts of other activities inside 
And so um, this has really snowballed, if you will, yeah. into this huge thing. And so we just want to do it right. Uh, we want to push it to the point where if you're going to talk about student success and guided pathways, then you need to think about how are we designing these spaces to create all sorts of opportunities for all sorts of students. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. even simple things like moving the classroom outdoors. Yeah. You know, there's no space for that. They mm -hmm. built a new uh, student center uh, services center, and there's this huge plaza out front, and it is so oppressive, right? There's no shade. Um, it's this big concrete, got uh, just unbearable space. Um, it works well for these activities, these events, you know, like they just had uh, their college university transfer fair. But even then, sitting there out at a table in, in the bare sun is just, it's unbearable. And so, and, and there's also, there's no place on campus, there's no identity, mm -hmm. right? There's no, there's no campus identity. There's no student identity. Um, I mean, I could just go on and on. I mean, it'll probably become a, you know, several hundred page report <laughs> at this stage. But the whole idea is we want to get as many students involved and we want them to have a really prominent voice within this report as people are listening and it's and it is this the timing of this is something steve because there is a lot of construction happening on campus i mean this is kind of the like southwest college of 10 15 years ago i mean a lot mm -hmm. and for this not to have been mm -hmm. kind of incorporated it's not like you're coming along in a time when you know yeah. nothing's happening Exactly. And, and so a lot can happen and can be affected. So Kudos everyone should... for bringing it, you know, bringing it front and center. Yeah. Yep. It's good. And Steve, by the way, the, the round table's on the 19th. If you're in town, mm -hmm. let's talk. Okay. Okay. Um, we are going to be joined by someone from Steinberg Hart, who is a campus higher ed sector campus planner. Um, and then, of course, we're going to be um, joined by the VP of Academic Affairs, mm -hmm. um, someone from the library, either the dean or assistant dean, yeah. um, and then students. One of the students who's, who started this whole thing, I've invited her to join the conversation. Nice, nice. Incidentally, Ruben, when Rob, when we were down at uh, Sixth and Olive in the City National, what was the City National building, for the first five years of our lease, we occupied the entire floor because they made us a deal back then that was crazy um, to get a whole floor of that building. Well, five years in, we had changed our strategy from one of growing to shrinking to become more nimble and focus on the areas of the practice that we felt like we really enjoyed and were less vulnerable for. Because in 1995, we had grown to like 30 people and then Disney came raiding us and within six months, we had lost seven key people. Uh, and with that, we felt like we were so vulnerable that we would be better off closing ranks and getting smaller. So we worked with the landlord and we did a plan to subdivide the floor in half. And it ended up that Steinberg took the other half. So we <laughs> Steinberg Hart, with really? With them, yeah. I know, you know, I know those guys, David Hart, Dave Matani, you know, uh, Simon Ho, Simon Ho. Um, right. In new context now, but yeah, it's a small world we live in. As well, I graduated always. with um, Kim Patton. She's a partner. Oh, yeah, she's a partner, and um, she put me in touch with uh, Benedetta. I forgot her last name, but she's originally from Spain, mm. and mm. she is sort of the campus urban designer, if you will. Cool, cool. Yeah. Well, all right. I well, got a lot to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So if you're available, let's uh, connect. Pardon. I'll put you guys in touch with each other. The, la the last announcement that many people don't know about, and I've been waiting to get more details on, is May 4th. I've been asked to become a panelist on uh, an event called Career Roundtables, a panel where professionals will come together and discuss their careers. And I was asked to join that panel to obviously talk about architecture, I mean, architecture. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so I don't know who the other panelists are, um, but it is a discussion that it's going to be on Zoom from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. on Wednesday, May 4th. 
it will not be recorded, so I've heard. Um, but stay tuned for information on that, and everybody's invited to do that. And many thanks to um, one of our club uh, leaders that introduced me or um, had me introduced to them and it got me invited to that. So the ECC Architecture Club is working. Um, so everybody stay in tune with those things. But without further ado, for tonight's hot topic, um, I want to introduce Steve Lewis, somebody I've known now for, oh my goodness, it's been a long, long time, over 30 years. Uh, Steve was one of the founding principals of the firm that he just spoke of, Raw International, and um, is a longtime member of uh, NOMA, which um, is when I met him as I got out of school and got involved with NOMA. He's been a, um, mark me if I'm correct, you were a national president of NOMA, correct? That's, That's right. of the whole org. He's been heavily involved with the SoCal NOMA chapter, helped to keep it on respirator for many years in the early years of the 80s and early 90s. And, um, is a heck of a power forward <laughs> as we play basketball together. He knew his place <laughs> in the paint. Um, but I invited him today to be one of our guest lecturers because not of not only his diverse um, experience in architecture, both as a um, practitioner, um, partner, starter of a firm, you name it, which that firm is now one of the oldest African-American firms in the in the city that's that's still here and around but he's done a diversity of work I really call him a Forrest Gump of architecture um, and I'm hoping he has the time to touch on some of the things like working for GSA which is the government the services general, general, general services administration. administration and what they what they do is oversee all the uh, federal buildings from courthouses to diverse things. Um, but one of the key things, as you saw in the flyer that he worked on, is in urban design and um, really helping to turn Detroit around in uh, his work. So yet another thing I've tried to do to make our student body understand that as an architect, your experience is really empowering you to work in a multitude of different facets of professional practice. And so without uh, further ado, I'm gonna let Stephen talk more about him and show his work. Thank you, Ruben. We do go back, my brother. And uh, our fathers both were architects, which is very unusual. And so- uh, And we're both from New York. <laughs> New York, New York, so nice. They named it twice. All right. So it's, it's really great to be with you all. And I've got a lot to talk about because you are the future and it's very important that you get as much exposure to the breadth of the profession and its adjunct and related parts and pieces so that you can find your best lane um, to travel in. Not always the one that's the easiest or most comfortable, but the one that will benefit you and um, those around you uh, the most. So that's all any of us can really hope for. I'm sorry, Steve. I just want to jump in one brief second. To everybody online, if you are taking one of the classes and are getting credit for attending, Ruben. make sure you put your name in the chat. Yes. There you go. So are we good? OK. So this is just a little uh, overview of what I hope to cover with you. I'm going to speed through some of it because there's quite a lot here because um, there's just so much to share. So I'm going to start by, you know, giving you uh, a relatable story that maybe, you know, you can substitute yourself for me and put yourself in this kind of progression of experience that has led you to where you are now uh, pursuing this career. So for me, um, at about the eight years old, uh, I had this uh, grand awakening and I'm the oldest of four kids. Uh, we used to watch these shows on TV, um, and for us, our family was just like 
the Reed family or Dennis the Menace family. We all got together for dinner around the table every night. Uh, we all were mischievous and if we got in trouble, you know, our neighbors could uh, make that correction, shall we say. And uh, so as we looked at these families on TV, we just saw ourselves reflected there. And we really, this was before we had a sort of racial consciousness. But myself being the oldest, also recognize that if you just change the channel, you will um, see this kind of thing going on and start to ask your parents questions like, what's this about? And it opens up the whole uh, awakening of the parallel universes that Black folks and other marginalized members of marginalized groups have to learn to navigate through in order to one, survive, but more uh, hopefully thrive. And so um, with that awakening uh, came this attachment to my father who was an architect, who I remember uh, moonlighting after his day job as a project architect, um, with a majority firm in New York City coming home to Long Island and staying up all night and doing these projects um, that started to present themselves more frequently in the late 1960s, early 1970s, so that at a certain point, he and another associate, both Howard University graduates, decided to start their firm. So they started the Lewis Turner Partnership uh, by under a different name initially, but then it graduated into that. And he became my guidepost. Um, I learned about architecture, the do's and don'ts, the successes and the failures firsthand. And it became invaluable to me as I went through and started to create my own pathway. So after the awakening really was about inspiration. And it so happened that back in the 60s, my dad was part of a small group and I don't know how this came to be. And unfortunately he's gone along now to the other place and I can't ask him uh, and get an answer back anyway. I always ask him, uh, how did it come to be that they, this small group of, of oddballs got to design the Venezuelan pavilion at the 64, 65 World's Fair, but they did. And I can remember coming into our dining room one day and seeing this chipboard model sitting on the table and I was fascinated. I, I, I just didn't know what that was. And I thought it was just incredible. And he used to take me uh, to the site of the World's Fair as it was being constructed. So as an eight-year-old kid, seven or eight-year-old kid, I'm going out there, I'm seeing all this construction. Um, I see a, a dump truck show up in front of our house one day with a load of um, this beautiful gravel that he somehow sequestered from the uh, job site that we poured patios for all of our neighbors with this beautiful exposed aggregate. Now, those things are in the ground still, so those are the legacy. But, you know, for me, uh, the fascination was once the fair was completed, we got to go back as a family, as, as a patron. So we got admission, we went in, we went to the GM city of the future, rode around in this little rail car through what was imagined as a future, which we're now living in, and uh, really was struck by the uh, science pavilion on the other side of the Grand Central Parkway, which was this crazy kind of um, amorphous shaped building with a lot of stained glass windows in it. And again, uh, my interest was peaked. I was alive with excitement when I was at this place. And of course, the iconic Unisphere, which even today remains and symbolizes the aspiration of we as a people. So that was, you know, a big part of my inspiration as I was later able to then reflect on it, not understanding uh, at the time that it was imprinting on me a destiny that I'm living out right now. So awakening, inspiration, and then impressionability. Uh, so now I'm getting older and I'm seeing this stuff and I know something's not right. And I'm watching my dad and his partner, Frank Turner, as they start this firm. And I'm going to meetings um, with all of that cohort of black architects that emerged in the early 1970s, like Max Bond and Don Ryder and Jim Dolman and Harry Simmons and Benny Thompson, I can name them, you know, and these are people who you don't know, but these were the people whose shoulders I stand on. Um, these New York architects that were like salmon 
When you see salmon swimming upstream against those rapids, you think, how the heck can that actually be possible? Well, that's the way it is for certain architects too. They're gonna to swim upstream, they're gonna find a way because what's at the end of that is what's really important to them. And that's a matter of each of us reaching that, you know, sort of conclusion on our own. So of course, after receiving all of that information, I had to go somewhere where I could actually sort of put it all together and have a cognitive moment. So in my case, it was Duns River Falls in Jamaica, because I got some Jamaican peeps and I had to go down there and just figure this all out. My joke slide. Um, I did make a decision uh, as I was considering schools and I went to a school in Long Island, Malvern High School and my class, class of 74, was you know pretty much like 50, 50 black and white. Um, there were a few other, like some Asian students, some Latino students, but back then it was mostly, you know, black and white. And the class two years ahead of us were fully engaged in race riot fighting every day after school. And we as a class had come up together and we were all tight and we looked at that nonsense and we said, that's not us. And thanks to Facebook, all these years later, many of my classmates from high school are still in, in touch. And there's so much love there that it's, it's, it's just as, the relationships that you form now, some of them you'll have forever and you'll look back on them, you'll cherish them, and they become part of the fabric of who you, you are. So I, I didn't really consider an HBCU, even though um, my dad was a Howard University graduate, I didn't really apply to historically black colleges and universities. I had my sights set on MIT, actually. I applied to five colleges, five or six schools, Catholic University in Washington, DC, Miami of Ohio, um, Syracuse, MIT, and ironically, I got into all of them except my first choice, which was MIT. Didn't get into MIT, but I had a chance to visit Syracuse, and you guys are talking about these field trips, and th those things are really impressionable as well. I, I had a, a, a great time at Syracuse and decided that's where I was going to go, plus they were the school that gave me the most financial aid, the most money. So I went there and uh, had a very challenging first year, thought maybe I didn't want to do this, uh, applied to Pratt to transfer. Uh, they accepted me, but didn't give me as, nearly as much money. So I ended up having to go back to Syracuse, which was a, forcing me to mature. And it was the best thing that could have ever happened because I flourished there afterwards and um, have you know great memories of my time there. Excuse me, as Ruben said, I've dabbled here and there, but my career has really been um, a mixture of private practice and public service. Even starting back in college, you know, I had a work study job as part of my financial aid and it started off putting me in a women's dorm where I sat at the desk at the entry. And this was before all those crazy world events that caused all the security. So then people could just come and go and I'd be the person who sort of check your ID, make sure you come in. But I was able to get my work study transferred to the Syracuse Onondaga City County Planning Agency. And it, as, a, as a third year, I was actually doing my first stint of public service. After that, obviously worked for my father, came to LA, went to work for the Redevelopment Agency, which no longer exists, the CRA. Uh, so that was back on the public side. But then, um, in 1984, came together with Roland Wiley and Stephen Lott, and they, Steve was out of architecture at that point. Roland had left Gruen Associates, one of the major LA firms, and started uh, this, this venture from his living room. Uh, Steve Lott happened to have, among his seven or so hustles, businesses that he was doing, he had a, a vacant office space in View Park and in, in, um, Lemur Park area. And he told Roland to get out of his living room and go, go down there and work there. And that's when I had come into the scene. So we, Roland and I struck an agreement. I really didn't know about Steve for a while. And then he came into the scene, we pulled him back in and he became the design partner. Roland was a managing partner. I was a partner in charge of technology and, and, and personnel. And of course, a small firm is like a fishbowl. You know, it's a great training ground because there's nowhere to hide. There are no other people to take the hit if, if you do something wrong. So you're gonna learn. Uh, by trial and error, and hopefully you're in a supportive, nurturing environment so that those lessons become uh, useful and informative about how you develop as an architect. Uh, as a Black-owned firm, 100%, we came into being at a time where there still was affirmative action, and there were lots of opportunities for minority-owned firms, but typically if you engaged in those kind of partnerships, you were given a scrap 
It's a tantamount to the kind of food that the enslaved people used to get, the, the, the things that got thrown out by the master's house. And th those became uh, things that were turned into what we now pay lots of money in the supermarket for, like oxtail and pig feet and all that other stuff. Um, but we, um, we decided for the first three or four years of our practice, we were gonna make it or break it based on our design capability. And we were very, very lucky, very fortunate to fall into some clients that one led to another, to another. And we had opportunities to really exercise that design muscle, most notably as the tenant improvement architect for the Pacific Design Center, which at the time featured countless showrooms, material and product showrooms. And we did the back of house stuff for the design center, like if they needed to upgrade restrooms for accessibility or phone, we did this bank of public telephones, if y'all know what those are. You used to be able to drop a dime in that sucker and make a phone call. Well, the PDC had a bank of these things and they said, well, we need to um, partition these phones. So the design center had, designed by Cesar Pelli, had three buildings that were designed, one of which was built, which was affectionately known as the Blue Whale or the Noxima building in West Hollywood. There was a, that blue one, there was a, a red one and a green one. And each of them had a unique profile in, in their section, the shape. And one of our guys, Brian Williams, had the clever idea of using the profile of each of those buildings in its color as the dividers between the phones. And when the design center uh, clients saw that, they thought, wow, these guys are actually really creative. So when a showroom would come in to negotiate leasing 5,000 square feet for Armstrong World Industries or uh, this one Sinkai Hong for Asian artifacts, they would say, well, who's, you know, who's in town that we can go to for design? And they'd say, well, you know, like Gensler's over here and HOK's over there, but they're these young guys they are really creative and they're good They do all our work and raw. Before you know it, we were doing more showrooms in the Pacific Design Center than any other firm singularly. And to this day, I think that remains. We did a, a restaurant in, inside of there. So this is an array of images of some of our more creative and successful work that we did and a 20 year timeline. It was upon this 20 year anniversary in 2004 that I announced my departure because I had been um, solicited by as Ruben indicated, the General Services Administration in their office of the chief architect, which ran a design excellence program that was mission was to take the punch card facade architecture out of the 60s and move it to a whole nother level where the best and brightest architects in the country were competing to get this, these contracts. And they started to see that they were only white male led firms that were getting these projects. And they said, well, these projects are being built with taxpayer dollars. So Steve, can you help us attract talent from other corners and convince them that the selection process is no longer the way it used to be, which he who kills the most trees and makes the fattest proposal gets the job, or he who knows whoever gets the job or she. In this case, it was a quarter of an inch thick lead designer's portfolio that showed your attitude and approach to how you would handle this project. And if Ruben Jacobs, the sole proprietor, was awarded that project, he could go down the street to Gruen Associates or HOK and say, hey, I've just been awarded this project and I needed an architect of record. And they would gladly jump on board and serve that purpose. So it really flattened the curve as far as being competitive going after this work and it made it accessible and available to, to many. I lasted four years in the federal space and then I came back into the private sector um, and was doing a number of different things in that private sector until I got a call from my good friend Maurice Cox, who was appointed by the mayor of Detroit as a new planning director with the charge of standing up a, a new planning department. Um, and so I answered that call. It also included a teaching appointment at University of Michigan. So I taught a seminar that I created called Designing with Community, which really talked about the ins and outs of meaningful community engagement and how you, how you go about that. And then in the other semester, I uh, co-taught at Urban Design Studio, where we focused on a project to restore what was the vibrant um, main street of the Black community in Detroit that was erased by a freeway to remove that freeway and restore to a boulevard condition and look at what could then happen with the surroundings in terms of land use and development and how some of that could be funneled to what we call restorative justice so that the descendants of those who were displaced and in fact some who are still alive would have some stake in it, some opportunity for a new, new kind of ownership, a new kind of collaboration. And so that kind of work on the public side 
is incredibly meaningful and incredibly important because you're now not satisfying your ego in terms of designing an object building that you can stand back and observe and admire, but you are actually affecting the lives of people by bringing them into a process and working with them in a way that acknowledges their um, you know, importance and, and gives them respect and dignity. And at the same time, creates enough trust for you to elevate the ideas based on the training that you have as an architect beyond what they might understand, but it still incorporates the spirit of what their interests are. And that's a win-win for everyone. So enough said about that. It's just a, a plug for, for public service for those of you who are so inclined. Uh, th these are, um, again, samples of the work from RAW. Uh, the Compton uh, Library Project, which you see on the upper two right images, that was, interestingly enough, just on the news last week. I saw that as a backdrop to a story that they were doing on Compton College and a program they have. But um, just a, a wide range and a variety. I will say that after achieving this kind of success, we did Motown Records Corporate Headquarters, we did the um, Fusion Restaurant in the upper left. We did the Mo um, uh, Armstrong World Industries product showroom at PDC in the lower left. And then in the two center lower pictures are the um, Little Aviators Child Care Center for the federal government that I designed, co-designed with Joe Otto, who's a Ghanaian architect who was here in LA for a while. And together we designed this, which ended up winning a national GSA design award. And that put me on the radar for the national GSA folks. And that's the backstory of how I ended up leaving my practice with Roland and Steve and going back to DC and spending those four years back there. It really is all about, it revolves around this term, this phrase of being a citizen architect. Um, I identify myself that way because of my commitment to working on things larger than myself. I have a always a simmering in the back burner consulting practice called Thinking Leadership who we are and what we do, sort of a double entendre there. But um, I'm also very involved with the AIA as well as NOMA. And in this photograph, I'm signing an MOU between the National Organization of Minority Architects and the American Institute of Architects with the then president, Marvin Malika, who we um, was the head of the new school in San Diego. You're gonna go there, but Marvin passed away several years ago and it was a huge loss for us. Um, Citizen architect defined, I'm not gonna waste time on this uh, because if you are interested, uh, this presentation will be available to you after I'm done and you can go back and anything I skim over and you're interested in, you can um, kind of go back and check. But I think out of this, I really wanna stress that core values uh, are really important because you're often gonna be confronted with situations where you have to make a choice and a decision and what guides those choices and decisions is incredibly important because it starts to define you as an individual and sets you on a path, either a righteous path or one is not so righteous, which ultimately can drag you into some places that unfortunately you, you won't wanna be. So I really am a supporter of, of honesty, of integrity, transparency. If you tell it the way it is, there's nothing to hide and therefore you're not vulnerable. Empathy, certainly to feel others' conditions, to be able to be responsive to those. Humility, to always learn, and then to be dedicated, which if you're in this program at this point, I must say you must be dedicated. Some of the actions um, I've found through travel, because that's part of the ever ongoing awakening. Uh, and I was a Loeb Fellow at Harvard, which is a, excuse me, a mid-career fellowship for a year at Harvard. Um, I used to joke and say it took me 50 years, but I finally made it to Harvard and MIT. My first choice that I got rejected from, I was able to take a class at MIT and walk up those steps off of Massachusetts Avenue and go in and feel like full circle. But, you know, our Loeb class went to South Africa, where I happened to have been working on a pro bono project, and we were able to really <sighs> pictures worth a thousand words. I don't think I have to say much about what you're looking at here, full spectrum. But you know, when you look at the eyes of these children, they don't know they're poor, they don't know they're orphaned, they don't know that they are compromised health-wise. They're like every kid, full of possibilities. The future is theirs if given opportunity. And so this tugged on our hearts, um, my cohort, as we were there. And just um, our constant reminders that there are things so much bigger and greater than each of us and we have to dedicate ourselves to that to make a world a better place. 
I've also been called a disaster chaser because this is New Orleans after Katrina and a group of us went down to see how we might be of assistance to get Noma involved. And um, these were photographs I took then, which tell a big story. I mean, on the lower right, this house pretty much intact, except it's sitting in the middle of a street, just got lifted off its foundation and dropped somewhere else. And in the lower left, you see a car in that garage, except the car is upside down. It's still in the garage, but it's upside down, it got flipped. So there was so much destruction and yet there was a spirit, uh, the New Orleans spirit of we're coming back. Uh, when I was Nolan president, I joined with the then AIA national president, George Miller, who at the time was a managing partner for IM Pay and Partners. And the two of us went to Haiti after the earthquake. And again, we wanted to see firsthand what the real conditions were beyond what you could see on CNN and come back and inform our constituents from NOMA and AIA and marshal some resources to see how we could be of assistance. It was hard to describe, but in my life, necessary to see. Uh, later, a few years later, a tornado ripped through Birmingham, Alabama, literally flattened a neighborhood. Um, and I offered my services to a dear friend who's part of my Harvard class who was a real estate developer in Birmingham. And she, I happened to be in between on my own at that moment. And she said, well, can you come? And I said, if you can give me an airplane ticket. So she cashed in some Delta miles and then I went. And this is kind of what I saw. And her dad was a pilot and he flew us around down to um, where the tornado first touched down and flew us back and, and just see this path of destruction from up in the air was remarkable. You see some of those photographs in the lower middle section. But literally, there was one house, I don't think that house is in these photos, but you could look across and there was no roof, there were no walls, but you could see this dining room table sitting like in perfect position on the floor plan, but it came from another house. <laughs> it flew over and landed just where it needed to be. It was incredible. So I, that plug in there is to encourage you all to see the world as much as you can, to get out of your neighborhoods, to go out and see as far as you can reach and to be observant and to be um, receptive. Uh, now, you know, at Ruben's request, but also part of my, you know, love to talk about is Detroit and hard work in the comeback city. Um, and I claim it to be the singular opportunity we were built for because it came at a time where Detroit was so accustomed to promises unfulfilled. And then by this mayor coming in with a new vision and a new energy and a new connection with the population, the 700 or so thousand Detroiters in a city that was meant for 15, for 1.5 million, uh, whose roads were built for 1.5 million, but who only have a little less than half of that riding around. So big fat roads that we need to put on road diets, all kinds of stuff. The image here is a segment that I shot of the Diego Rivera mural that adorns the four walls of the courtyard of the Detroit Institute of Arts. During Detroit's bankruptcy, one of the options on the table was to sell off all of the collections at the Detroit Institute of Arts, which would have garnered enough money to help the city sort of recover. Philanthropies showed up and said, no way, and put their money together and helped bail out the city so that all of the art in the Detroit Institute of Arts is still available for all of us to enjoy. I like, this is the central station, which the photographers who trade in what we call ruin porn, which is finding these desolate, derelict places and making them as sexy as possible in the photograph, saturating them and doing all kinds of contrasts and whatnot, um, <clears throat> too easy and not respectful in my view. And as a photographer myself, I vowed not to exploit <clears throat> the ruins of the Detroit but someone else and many others did, and this is the central station depicted that way, which I call the unfair portrayal. Because when I arrived, I found the beautiful discovery, which is this incredibly resilient, gritty population of all people from all walks of life, who in this case assemble every Saturday at the um, Eastern Market, one of the oldest, uh, largest working markets that exist till today where you can go get all kinds of fruits, vegetables, um, bacon, uh, you know, all kinds of pig parts, whatever. 
but it's this remarkable, you know, uh, I like to say that everyone who has ever lost in the Bermuda Triangle, they come here and they show up on Saturday and you can find them here because it's just everybody coming to Eastern Market. Once again, this is the, the way that Detroit is often depicted in the media, the world sees, but upon closer examination, you still have these wonderful gems and these neighborhoods that are vibrant. And so it's a mixed bag. Certainly there's a lot of, you know, a lot to still recover from. On the left, upper left, you see the two uh, Lafayette Towers designed by Mies van der Rohe as part of the Lafayette Park development that he designed that are complemented by the townhouses that you see on the lower right, which are these beautifully elegant steel and glass uh, row house townhouses that um, have spiked in value. Uh, and uh, many architects have chosen to pay that money just to live in these places. Pretty, pretty amazing. And then on the lower left, uh, the new uh, light rail, well, not new anymore, but there's actually a 3.1 mile leg of a light rail that's connecting parts of the city and allowing people, even though Detroit's the motor city, it's got 33% of the residents don't have cars. So having a way to get from the northern part of the city near where the Motown Museum and all that stuff is down to the river and this lower area of this downtown has been a real um, a boon for a lot of people, giving them access to jobs, healthcare, you know, amenities and other things that they wouldn't already automatically have in their own neighborhoods. Um, you know, as Maurice built this planning department with the intention of making it look and reflect the ethnicity of the population. And in Detroit, it was like an 80% Black city with a lot of um, Latino uh, residents as well. And so the, the face of the planning department really started to reflect the city. And that really, I think, helped when we were out meeting with communities about neighborhood framework plans that we were doing, getting them to eventually um, make a leap of faith and trust us. And then we were there compelled to deliver. Um, so we had a vision and a mission. We went to the campus of, um, uh, oh shoot, I'm blanking, um, famous uh, school and creative school and where Saren and all of them guys went. And anyway, we spent a day out there beating each other up to come up with a simple few words of a vision statement and a mission statement. And one of our mantras was, you know, an entendre on the planning department, we're planning to stay. So we really want residents who stayed in Detroit through the bad times, either because they couldn't afford to move anywhere else, or they were just such, so fiercely proud of being Detroiters that they refused to give in and move as the quality of services and the quality of neighborhoods just continued to decline and decline. Now we're having this renaissance, this resurgence, and there's a real focus on planning to stay, allowing these residents a way to withstand the investment of gentrification without the boogeyman part of it, which is displacement. And for any of you who are just interested in this phenomenon of what happens when new investment comes in and all of a sudden the sidewalks you've been calling, the, the broken sidewalks you've been calling the city about for 30 years uh, get starting to get fixed as soon as the first white family moves in on the block and you start to see police roaming around and whatnot, and you think, okay, it's just a matter of time before I get booted, but we've got things in place in Detroit to help mitigate and avoid that as much as possible. And, and I apologize for any of you who might take any offense at how I'm being raw with my descriptions, because that's who I am. I'm just real about this stuff. And you know, you can plaster me after through the chat window or whatever, but um, you can tell I'm a little passionate about this stuff. So I'm going to share some of the projects that were done while I was there. This was the first one I got handed to me. It was the um, sort of revisioning of the Detroit Riverfront, which for decades has been an industrial riverfront, uh, lots of mounds of aggregate and coal and barges coming down the Detroit River and not the best environment um, and certainly not a place for the public. Well, the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy, which is a nonprofit that got stood up, I don't know, 10 or so years ago, 15 maybe, has been steadily working on um, improving the riverfront for pedestrian use. But this study that we did with Skidmore, Owings and Merrill as the lead consultant, SOM, really transformed it into about a 22 million square feet of new development over a 30 year kind of time frame. And we came up with this beautiful plan that had this big vision long-term and the mayor said to us, that's nice, but out of all of what you're, you've developed here, 
I want you to pick out the things that are achievable within a three-year time frame based on availability of funds, based on readiness. And as we scrub through everything we'd done, we came up with these four strategies. Parks and green open space, we had the ability to do some land swapping with a state agency and get that riverfront edge so that we could restrict development from encroaching down at that edge and make it much more of a park-like public space. Greenways were these pathways that went from the riverfront up into these neighborhoods that were initially done by the first black mayor of Detroit in the 70s, Coleman Young, who was mayor for 20 years, started off right but ended wrong. Um, but he built these pathways to give this, the residents to the north a, a, a way to get to the riverfront and they've fallen into disrepair. But we had through the Riverfront Conservancy, the, the means by which to renovate those um, pathways and bring them back uh, to life. And we had funds through a number of sources to do streetscape improvements, which would involve landscape, hardscape along the street edges, and then um, parcels that the city owned along the riverfront were then prepared for development with the issuance of requests for proposals from the development community for particular project types where the city owned that land. So those were the things that we had control over and that we could actually affect. Before we came to this um, sort of conclusion or, or mission, uh, development could have taken place like this close and proximate to the river edge. And that landscape area, that wetlands that you see was done by the conservancy as a sort of phase one that restored the habitat to that uh, which was present when the city first settled. There's a lot of ribbon farms and marshes and all of the flora and fauna that go along with that. So what we were able to do was to pull development back to um, the first east-west street called Atwater Street and preserve all of that space for the public good in this park-like space. The white buildings you see on the right represent that line along Atwater where those buildings would be held to. There are sections of the promenade that, you know, that's already existing that are interrupted. And this is a big one. This is what's formerly a Uniroyal site that was very dirty. Half of it got cleaned up environmentally. The other half has been under cleanup. But the idea was then to improve it as a connector between different parts of the riverfront that were, you know, where it interrupted them. And so this became this amazing kind of promenade section with different uh, zones for pedestrians, for bicyclists, skaters, et cetera, and a seating zone along the river itself. And this was uh, done by SOM in collaboration with a French landscape architect uh, named Michel Duvin, who was brilliant and um, just brought this, this vision to the, to the project. This is an example of one of those pathways I was just describing going up into the neighborhoods. And as you can see, it's fallen into total disrepair. And this is what it's uh, being converted to now. Uh, the the red and orange red orange stanchion there is a um, call call box which are planted like every uh, 500 feet uh, so that if you do encounter any kind of problem you can just jump on that thing and there's a whole legion of, of security folks on bicycles that can get to you within five minutes and so giving people the comfort and confidence to be able to use the spaces after you've created them was another big part of that puzzle. I mentioned earlier about Detroit's big roads that were made to handle the Motor City, all of this traffic, and you got a fraction of that traffic. So the idea was to put them on road diets, create dedicated bike lanes, um, improve the medians with landscape in between and along the edges, um, just do materiality, scale the streets down, slow the traffic. And um, Detroiters really didn't like this idea. So we installed it initially as a sort of temporary installation let it stand for a couple of years until people get used to it. And um, I believe that now, and this is since I've been gone, that they are moving to make this uh, permanent um, fix. Atwater Street is the street that the development is being restricted to. And so um, some very brilliant sort of ideation by SOM in terms of how that can be transformed with mixed use development. Why not have housing that looks out in the Detroit River rather than some industrial pile of crap? I mean, this is just that makes so much sense. 
And you know, the, because of the industrial character of the Riverfront District, we wanted to preserve that because Detroit, if nothing else, is all about authenticity. So conceptually here, we do some adaptive reuse of some of these buildings. We then add on to the tops of some of them and you can get something like this. You, you rip off the asphalt and bring back the cobblestones and the brick underlay that's there and make it very pedestrian oriented. Um, and so these are some of the ideas. This is the final sort of 22 million square feet over the 30 year vision, which we were not allowed to show the public. Um, they, they, they have a short memory, the mayor said, and he said, if you show them this, they'll wonder after year three why it's all not done. And then you'll start barking at me all the time. And I'm like, yeah, good lesson there. So all of the urban design work that I do now in most places, we try to focus on what's implementable within that kind of three year time frame. a lesson very well learned, very valuable. So yo, in Detroit, you know, it's all about respect, respect for nature, respect for beauty. And, and Maurice always used to like to point out this black gentleman taking pictures of butterflies in a garden. I mean, we're about breaking down myths and dispelling stereotypes. We don't ride bikes. Yes, we do. Here we are. And uh, we do swim as well, all that good stuff. Um, great respect for history. Uh, Detroit is rich with it. Um, local is big. Entrepreneurship, lots of programs. Returning citizens, these guys were released from incarceration. They became part of the Greening of Detroit program, which trains these former bangers to be stewards of the landscapes in the neighborhoods that they used to perpetrate on. And a quick story, one of the brothers who was trying to get through this program, he just had so much pressure from outside that he missed some of the classes and he just didn't qualify, but he was a good guy and the head of the program knew it. So when he went with his lady and their kid to the ceremony, expecting that he was just gonna witness it, uh, after the certificates were given, the leader said, well, I have one more and it's for you, you deserve this and handed him the certificate and this guy, had a real teardrop under his eye, not one you put on when you do something real bad. So he was. This was just transformational for a lot of these people, and we believe in you know respect for that. Um, all about community voices. Nothing about us without us is for us. Wow, if you can live into that mantra, that's something else. And we we try. We're humbled by that every day because it's not easy. This is my um, flyer for the course, the seminar course that I, I took. And so it's bringing this kind of passion and this kind of experience into the classroom and then dragging the students to uh, community meetings, literally actual community meetings in the city of Detroit so they could see firsthand and actually give them a role so they could participate and they could get their appetite up for wanting to do that kind of work. Pivot to the place we're at now, architecture in the age of Jedi, which is about justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, as we like to think a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And I know that I was handed a light, lightsaber that moment George Floyd took his last breath, not to make, make any light of that, which was tragic, but literally the mute button was un, unlocked when that happened. And a lot of the stuff that many on this call, uh, Ruben, Elytris, Dwayne, you know, we've been talking about all of our careers may have been like muted. And then all of a sudden it's being heard, which is then translated into incredible opportunity for all of us now to be valued and to play a role. So that's the positive side. So, okay, this happened, okay? Life changed because we were all home with COVID, on COVID watch. Uh, firms like ZGF, which is 700 plus person firm, 16 partners, six offices, all of us have made these commitments and um, the ways in which we're doing it is we're building relationships with black owned firms, specifically at this point, because we're triaging black owned firms. We're still responsive and receptive to Latino, Latinx firms, to Native American firms, to whoever's having trouble because they're being marginalized. We're there for that, but we're looking at the 2% of all architects being black for 54 years being a problem. So that's like being triaged on the front lines. And with that comes these commitments, um, again, you can check these on the rebound when you, if you choose to go back and look at the, the, the slideshow. This is a project that we did under the One Plus program. It used to be called One Percent, and it was started by a buddy of mine, John Peterson, where he decided to uh, get 
architects, either individuals or firms to commit 1% of their billable time, which there's 2,080 hours, billable hours in a year. So 1% of that would be 20.8 hours. Commit that to working for a nonprofit pro bono for the public good. And about five or six years ago, he had amassed commitments that represented a firm of 300 people working 24 hours a day, seven days a week on, on behalf of nonprofits. So as part of that program, which has now evolved to be called the One Plus program, ZGF in our Seattle office worked with a group of 50 LGBTQ, LGBTQ BIPOC students who were homeless to develop a project called the Youth Achievement Center that included residential um, at two levels and lots of services. And we worked with a, a representative group of 10 of them and introduced them to things like Jack Travis's 10 Principles of Afrocentric Design and let them understand that and then make that their own and make these choices, led them through a process. And what we were able to come out with were these principles, the Youth Achievement Center design principles, uh, can start to convert the program into three dimensions, uh, rationalize the program in terms of the floor plan of these two different buildings, and then drop them onto these sites that were excess property from the Seattle Transit Authority that had built the light rail stations that you see on the left. I guess I can point my cursor. These are the platforms, just like we have, you know, metro platforms. But these were sites where they used for, during construction for laying down materials and equipment that now they are making available to a nonprofit. And this project, based on the work that we were able to do, and you see the cultural expression uh, in the facades that was generated out of the input we got from these kids, and of course, elevated, because that's what we're trained to do, uh, to a level where the cultural signature is rather undeniable, I think you'd agree. And so this has now led to a major fundraising campaign and the, the realization of this project seems to be within reach. Another project like that with the OnePlus was one we did in Portland with our Portland office for the Latino network. And this is just a nice thing to, to look at in terms of process. We were given a site, we were given a program, it has relationship to other buildings that are out there, as you can see on the left um, and the right. And then uh, coming up with this sort of vision and mission statement that's in their own words, um, this will be a dream come true for those of us that have been working with the community for all these years, blah, blah, blah. Word cloud, very useful to suss out where the priorities are and just really rationalizing everything into a set of principles, a lot of engagement. The photographs you see on the left, they're typical of what you see when we're undergoing these projects where we're engaging residents and stakeholders, getting right down on the paper with, with them, uh, providing tools that meet people where they are so that they can actually feel empowered to contribute rather than just sitting there silently listening to what someone else is telling them to get engaged and involved. So there's an art to that is my point. And coming out of all of that, uh, the program starts to get, you know, moved around as you see in these diagrams. And then um, the, the visioning boards looking at precedent images, projects of a similar type that give them sort of make real these the words in terms of what it could look like, what it could be like. And after reducing them to these categories, uh, the design took place and, um, led to the renders that really expressed all of that wrapped up in a nice package. So this is also um, being pursued as, a, as an actual real project. So this is more for firms and less for, for students and it's about you know living into an anti-racist present and future. So it's interesting stuff. You can check it later if you like. Uh, lastly, I'm gonna just Give you a quick update on the state of diversity and inclusion. This is a little older, this section, because it's now 54 years. And uh, Whitney Young was a major civil rights leader of the 60s and 70s. He, he attended an AIA conference and he was 
most quoted as saying, you architects are not a profession that has distinguished itself your social, by your social and civic contributions to the cause of civil rights. You're most distinguished by your thunderous silence and your complete irrelevance. And it was at that conference in 1968, I believe it was, that there were 12 uh, black architects that got themselves together and said, you know, we got to do something. If the AIA isn't going to do it, we got to do it. And that's where the seeds of NOMA were planted. This is again uh, almost current. Uh, there are now close to 2,500. Um, the numbers you see here, there are you know, fewer than 600 black women architects, um, a little over 1,900 black male architects. Um, and quickly, you know, what does it mean? If you're one of those salmon who managed to swim upstream and make it there, then you get to do work like the work of these people I'm gonna share with you. Rainy Hamilton's built a beautiful firm in Detroit. Uh, Phil Freelon, before he passed away several years ago and before he was merged with Perkins and Will, had the Freelon Group and did these amazing projects. Phil, I think, was our brightest shining light as a designer and was able to realize that and leverage it and take it to levels that um, maybe only a few others have been able to do, like Moody Nolan, Kurt and Jonathan Moody, and what they're doing. This is a, a friend, a colleague who had a small practice. He's now an academic only, but he um, was putting out work and ideas like this. And it was just, depending on where you're presenting this and to whom you're presenting it, it can be uh, totally mind blowing because people look at you and assume and associate you either consciously or subconsciously with a certain strata of, of, of work. Oh, you're a bus driver or you're a, you know, a cleaning lady or whatever. And no, no, we're doing this stuff. You already saw work from my boys at Raw. And then the greatest accomplishments is the African, the Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, DC, that everybody just assumes was done by David Ajay, uh, Sir David. Uh, but Phil Freelon and Max Bond actually li lined this up in advance. They did the initial programming and they got it on track so that their firm was selected out of the six finalists in the competition, the only one of the six that happened to be an all black led team uh, known as the Fab Studio, Freelon EJ Bond. Pretty spectacular, except Max passed away with, from cancer and didn't get to realize it. Um, but he was an amazing forefather and patriarch of us. And of course you see the beautiful design the way that the museum turned out. Uh, Stull and Lee out of Boston. We, again, this is legacy. Uh, Don Stull and David Lee. Don passed away a couple of years ago. David used to be the lead urban design professor at Harvard, um, but he still has his firm. And you can see elements of culture expressed. Maybe you don't know exactly what, where they come from and what they are representing, but you know something's going on there. And to provoke the curiosity is in and, in and of itself a worthwhile endeavor. Uh, this brother's become a very good friend of mine, Michael Marshall. He's a Yale graduate um, and has a firm in DC. And he does these beautiful hand drawings or constructed perspectives by hand. Um, and every new person that comes into his firm, well, at least before computers were the avant-garde, he would teach them how to draw with this same hand so that all the work coming out of there looked like it came from the same place. Uh, this husband and wife team out of New York, they won the New York State Design Award for this Brooklyn project they did, the Weeksville Center on the upper right. Wonderful project. Noma had a big event there at the Brooklyn Conference two years ago, and they do some outstanding work. And they're also academics. They have a, a studio that they teach at Yale, and I was a guest critic for them a few years ago, which is nice. Uh, the Citizen Architect, too often hidden in plain sight. And this photograph I took at Eastern Market of these flowers, I've decided to bury these ghosted images of my colleagues who are all in that category of Citizen Architect. Even Corbusier got a little spot in the lower left-hand corner, but um, that's the word, y'all. Awesome presentation there. I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> a lot to, lot to cover. So certainly we, we, we had room and do have room for question and answer. So I, I only saw one question there, but you know, you guys could turn on your cameras, reveal your faces and all that good stuff. And by all means, uh, let's, let's take advantage of Steve's time and uh, ask any questions that you may have. 
Indeed. I, I was in the process of typing mine, but it's kind of long. So yeah, <laughs> let it go. I just ask it. Okay, cool. Perfect. Uh, yeah. Amazing presentation. I, that was, that was really powerful. I think what really uh, touched me was your, your presentation on the youth achievement center. Um, and, and it kind of, kind of, it, it's a hard string for me because being part of the queer identity, um, I see the ramifications, gentrification, especially regarding queer history. And I see it kind of, especially when I was teaching in Hollywood as a public school teacher, I saw uh, places that were kind of safe for LGBTQ youth kind of being eradicated by gentrification. So I know you mentioned, touched a little bit about uh, gentrification in Detroit and and um, the challenges of that, especially with the uh, police. Is there anything that I don't know that perhaps uh, would be a solution to in terms of gentrification in regarding um, you know uh, the eradication of history. Yeah, the, the erasure is the erasure is big. Uh, we, you know, we have to preserve uh, all of our histories, and one way to do that is through architecture, which stands most often longer than we do on this planet. But um, the challenge is that we live in a capitalist free market society where. Elon Musk just demonstrated what happens when you're denied the acquisition of something like Twitter. You just raise the, the, the price and then you get it. So if Eric, you lived on, you know, Edmond Street in Detroit and new neighbors started moving in and you're on a fixed income and say you own the place, but your property taxes start to go up, you could get in arrears and get displaced you could get evicted you know foreclosed on yeah. how do you how do you mitigate against that what's available within the framework of a capitalist society to be able to allow that and one way the mayor did was he capped property tax increases and tied them to cost of living increases so that as the fixed income advances with cost of living increases they're able to compensate and and handle those but inevitably if you're a renter, you're really vulnerable because all of a sudden, you know, the block starts improving and I own these buildings and I'm renting them and I can get a ton more money. So I'm getting it. So, okay, Eric, you have to move. Well, the mayor's made available through a bridging neighborhoods program, a house for you within the city limits of Detroit. If you feel that strongly about being a Detroiter, you will have an opportunity to swap out and live in that city. It might not be in that exact neighborhood. And I think it's a very imperfect kind of a solution, but it is nevertheless what is available within the, the constructs of this capitalist free market society that where money drives everything. Yeah, that's a, definitely a possible solution because it's. I, I came from the Bay Area and I saw a lot of people just, uh, especially certain communities, being displaced because yeah. of gentrification. Yeah, and I appreciate the, the question. It's um, it's it's kind of the why I'm was so passionate about with the students about taking your gifts and applying them to the public good. Um, because, you know, if we don't fix this stuff, who is, you know, and we might not see it all fixed in our lifetimes, us certainly, and you all maybe, <laughs> but, you know, we got to fight the fight. Hey, Don and, Hicks, Don Hicks and, what up? I see Don, I see Michael Powell, I see my people over here. Uh huh. What up, man? Well, now Abigail had a, a question and she, she, uh, I think she posed it to me, but I'm going to pose it to Steve because Steve did have a practice. And it's, it's, you mentioned that small firms are similar to training grounds and that there's no one else to hide behind in that scenario. Would you mind elaborating on this, please? Sure, sure. Well, I'll go to a scenario and then back my way into that. So the scenario is you go to work for a large majority firm like mine, like ZGF. You get put on a project and you're part of a team. You're the junior person. The project manager is a middle-aged white male. Just use that scenario. Um, is very uncomfortable engaging in the kind of critique 
that most of us in our era came up through in architecture school. And this would be faculty as well in school being reluctant, being very sort of cautious. And as a result, he tells you at the end of that day, look, takes a look at your work and says, okay, good job, we'll see you tomorrow. And as you get up to leave, you hear him say to the young man, uh, the, 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 to your basic experience level, hey, can you stay a little late and you know, fix this stuff? And then you're thinking like, well, what just happened? You know, uh, so one of the big things is you can attain a sense of false ability when you're protected or better word denied the full content of a critique so that you can grow. So that you can know what's not a good thing to do uh, and what is a preferred way. So then you get let go. And guess what? You come knocking on my door because I'm a black or Latin owned firm and you say, hey, what up y'all? And I say, come on in, come to Raw University as we used to call ourselves. And then you, we say, well, so what do you do? And what have you done? And well, I've worked on this, I've worked on that. Okay, cool, look at the drawings. You know, you may have done a little bit of them but somebody else did most of them. And you're like, yeah, that's my stuff. And we're like, cool, so we hire you and we immediately put you to work on a project and you don't know what to do. <laughs> and we're looking at you saying, I thought you, and then we say, ah, got it. So now you're enrolled in Raw University and you're gonna get the school of hard knocks. But when you leave there, you will be much in demand because you know that you have to work twice as hard to be as good and that you uh, pride yourself on representing your cohort as best you can and you have a sense of pride and self-respect and dignity that you carry with you after that point. And we have to reluctantly say goodbye and good luck and make way for the next one that comes in. Occasionally, one of those brilliant, talented people like you will stick around and stay and then you have a legacy to share with the partners, so. Was that where you were going with that question, Abigail? Did that answer? Yes, sir. Answer really things? Thank you so much. <laughs> So anybody else, practitioners, that means you too, Dawn, I'm calling you out. And and others, students, have any anybody have any questions or thoughts, projects you saw? Dan, you want to add in anything in there too? I know he's giving everybody else a chance here, <laughs> but this is really an opportunity to, to speak your mind. It is a, a safe space. I got a couple of questions too. I'm waiting for you guys, though. <laughs> So come on, can bring I, it out. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Eric. Okay, cool. Um, I actually visited Detroit City a couple years ago. And I fell in love with it. I actually was thinking about moving there, but man, those those winters are cold. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I noticed was um, in, in downtown area there was um, Whole Foods there, and um, you know, and there was a lot of community outreach. But I was kind of conflicted because, you know, it's Whole Foods. So what, what did you think of the presence of Whole Foods in, in the middle of Detroit city? Yeah, I mean, it was controversial. Um, they did, you know, accept um, their food stamps and other uh, subsidy. But, you know, how much is that? How far is that going to go in, a, in, in Whole Foods, right? But, you know, I would go in and just observe. And it's not in downtown, it's in the area north of downtown called Midtown, mm -hmm. which is sort of a gentrified area, but you still have a lot of legacy folks that are living there. And I would just notice that the, the low-income patrons that were utilizing it were buying like vegetables and fruit and stuff that they didn't have access to in, in their neighborhood places, right? So in that sense, it, it brought a resource there. Um, th there's a, a real social social fabric in Detroit of caring for one another. And I think that carries on to diet and, and all that other stuff. Just another two blocks away, there was Gus's fried chicken. So the same person was buying a zucchini and Whole Foods was going to get their chicken wing over there, you know, so it's just a, it's a mixed bag. Um, but, but I would say that in the downtown now, there's a new, uh, rest, a new uh, supermarket. It's part of the Meyer, which is a big Michigan chain. They opened a smaller version, but it's amazing. Um, and it's front and center, just all of the fruits, vegetables and stuff. 
and they got you know everything and and everybody has been using it so great it's great to hear steven i just want to thank you again this is probably the third time i've heard you speak and it's just amazing every time i hear you um what's your take on what's going on in inglewood and the gentrification that's going on there and what are some of the ideas that we can start implementing that you've been involved with there? Well, you know, Ruben knows more than I do about Inglewood uh, in that situation, but I will say that I did um, have a virtual meeting with Mayor Butts about a year, year, year and a half ago, just to let him know that I had come from Detroit, wrestled with a lot of the issues that he's facing with gentrification and new investment and how to manage all that made myself available to him if he should have been so inclined. I think he looked at me and said, oh, who the hell are you? <laughs> but, uh, you know, so be it. I, I, I just think that uh, it takes intention and it has to have strong leadership. So none of this stuff in Detroit would have happened if the city had not elected its first white mayor in like 40 years, Mike Duggan, who was a write-in candidate at his first election and went about meeting with about 350 Detroit families of all over the city in their living rooms, went on a listening campaign. And when he, he was elected by a landslide, and during my tenure there, he was reelected by 73% of the vote. And then since my departure was reelected again. So he is in the people's eyes getting it done. Um, although you will get, he will get heckled at community meetings uh, from time to time, you know, so I think it's really having a mechanism to get the public's voice in in a constructive way that shows them some respect, but also demands respect on the other end of it. Getting back to what I was saying to Abigail, that, or maybe I was saying to Eric, but the free market capitalist society, that framework that we exist in, you got the wins that we get are often not going to be at the expense of what someone's going to gain through their capitalist enterprise, but ways to construct a win-win. So that if I can convince through some benevolent act, residents give them an opportunity to stay where they are and to thrive, they then become patrons and supporters of my other enterprises that need that clientele to thrive. So it's symbiotic kind of relationships, that's an oversimplification, but it, it, if the mayor is not leading the charge, the rest of us are little flames that pop up and get uh, extinguished. Excuse me, they get extinguished and maybe you know melt a little wax for a minute, but then they're gone. That's exactly what it looks like: um, lack of intention and lack of leadership. Um, it's it's tragic, but. Um, well, Michael, you know, um, just like in Lamar Park, Inglewood is Black folks' place, first and foremost, Latinx place, and we saw it coming. And some mobilized and put themselves in positions to be present and accounted for in the transactions that take place. But for the average person, you know, without that mayoral kind of leadership, you're just left to take the consequences and then have to move on from there, which often isn't to a better place. Yeah. Piggybacking on that on that question on what happened in Detroit, that riverfront uh, property, was that um, largely owned by the city or was it pri is privately owned? A lot of it's privately owned. The city owned three parcels um, and, a, and a, a big piece that they swapped with the state to get that riverfront area for the sort of marshland habitat. Um, but it's a lot of private ownership and those private owners are the, at the forefront of developing projects now. One of them is this brother, Mahdi Ture, who's a good friend of mine, who wasn't, he was the director of real estate for the sister agency called the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation. This, the planning department could do all the planning stuff and then got handed over to the Economic Growth Corporation to create RFPs for the development and then they oversee the development. And Mahdi left that position and started City Growth Partners, his own development company, and managed to buy a piece of that prime real estate along the riverfront. And he's got a project underway there, as well as in the um, 
neighborhood immediately to the north of downtown called Brush Park. So there were five development projects going on around the Lafayette Park area where I also lived and retained my residence there. Uh, our daughter Jenna stayed behind and she's been holding down the outpost in Detroit. Uh, she's actually working for Quinn Evans architecture firm now, which is full circle and teaching a drawing class to freshman architecture students at the University of Detroit Mercy, <laughs> which is just a mind blower for me. I mean, damn. Um, but anyway, um, now I forget where I was going with that thought. Oh, the, the, the uh, you know, we, I have a place to, to stay, you know, I'm going there in a week and a half from now for a week and I'll be back on my pad and working with that client back there. So who knows? So the, the, the spark in that was what the city planner did in kind of um, rejuvenating the open space. And that, that is what led to a lot of the development, like these five major projects that are going. Well, you know, Lafayette Park was an urban renewal site that Mies van der Rohe did the master plan for and pieces and parts of it got built, including those beautiful townhomes, the two towers, which are rental, owned by a black real estate guy who is like one of those landlords that doesn't invest back in his property. So he got everybody in an uproar, fix that elevator, man, whatever. Um, but then uh, in that surrounding, because that's a very highly sought after location, 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 because I could walk downtown to work, you know, it's that close. Um, four of those five development projects were led by black developers. So sharing the opportunity uh, because it was done with intention, you know, and you talk about restorative justice, people that were ripped away from their places of business and, and culture by a freeway, which happens in so many cities and left hanging out with nothing, you know, there's gotta be some restorative justice there. And so in, in these small ways, you know, uh, we're able to make some progress. So I thought I heard some other questions getting ready to sprout. Anybody have something they want to chime in, ask? Got four more minutes. I'm so... Oh, you're on mute, Dan. I am. I just wanted to say, I don't have a question, but I want to just, there's, you use some words that are really powerful. And, and I wrote a few down, but passion is one of them. Obviously, you exhibited passion. And that's something our students really need to understand to get them through the, the tough spots and to get them through the tough project and, and so forth in school or in, in life. And the other one's respect. It's huge. And, and those are things that they absolutely need to understand. And early on, you talked about... Um, the, the, the people you meet now and how they're going to be part of your life, those things. I mean, all the lessons that we learn about projects are one thing, but the other things that weave through everything in our life are probably the most powerful because they, they keep us all grounded to being just the people that we are and not, you know, no, no egos and no, no things, just simply taking care of each other and and, um, you know, using the talents of our, of our coworkers and our, and our people that we, uh, that we know. So thank you for sharing everything tonight. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, pretty powerful. No, thanks for that, Dan. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. And Juliana just made a comment that just the thought, but the Franklin street heritage area concept reminds me of some areas of the Atlanta belt line. Mm -hmm. It's interesting she said that because um, there's an RFP that we're responding to right now for the Joe Lewis Greenway, which is a 29 mile loop modeled after the Atlanta Beltline, where it connects all of the neighborhoods around Detroit to the riverfront area and becomes this catalytic ribbon around which development can um, start to thrive. And so we're, we're, I'm putting together a pretty incredible team going after that, including some local newly minted talent, uh, a sister who left um, Gensler to start her own, hang out her own little shingle. And she agreed to join my team today. There's another one that left the Smith Group as a landscape architect who's working with us on a Henry Ford project that we have right there now, who uh, got to a little too late because she committed herself 
exclusively to another competitor who's going after this. Oh, but, wow. Yeah, but that's the way it is. You know, it's all camaraderie out there. You know, you win some, you lose some, but I want to win this one. Um, but yeah, the, the belt line, I remember seeing it presented by Ryan, uh, forget his name. He was the student who came up with the idea who then went on and worked on implementing it. Um, and it's a long, long-term vision, but it's brought a lot of economic development and a lot of uh, gentrification, as I understand it. I have not been there to see it. I've been to Atlanta, but I haven't gone out to the Beltline site to just see how it's sort of manifesting. But, um, you know, there's all, always consequences in what's terrible for someone is going to be wonderful for somebody else. And that's where this balance of equity comes into the conversation, because if the same person's benefiting all the time and the other one is eating crap, is eating crap all the time, there's a little bit of a problem with that, you know? So how do we balance that equation? And those, both of those projects remind me locally here, that LA River project, what is it? The Alameda Corridor. If you, uh, you're here in LA, you may want to Google that as a student and see something that's been talked about like close to a couple of decades now, but it's coming closer to happening, isn't it? Well, Mia Lair has been very involved as the landscape architect along the LA River piece. I'm not sure how it ties into the Alameda Corridor or whether that's just a simply a separate project because that's yeah. more industrial infrastructure linking the ports with downtown and all of that. Yeah, because I'm really talking about the LA River one. The I LA may River. be misspeaking yeah. it, but certainly the river and that's what's also creating a natural connection to East LA and what's mm -hmm. going to affect on the other side of that. So there's really some interesting dynamics. And I, I should say for students, you need to, whether you're involved in those things or not, um, realize them, watch them, Fantastic. learn from them, because there's some really life moving things. And being in the architectural profession, you're going to be able to witness some things that others think just happened, but have been happening for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And there's going to be people in 2040 that are going to think what Steve worked on just happened. <laughs> and there's a lot of things like that in LA that are, you know, not just happening, they've been slowly happening. So my advice is pay attention to that because this is your profession and you will learn learn from it and see how to be a catalyst in it and be involved in it um take advantage of it all of those sort of things um just watch them and as steve said in his presentation early get out and go to places go as far as you can i'm always amazed talking to our students how many that haven't gotten up to say lamert park which is mm -hmm. only you know we're at 150 something street, it's at 40 something street and where Metro is changing things only a few blocks away from you, let alone, yeah. you know, Northern California, let alone in Spain or other places, you, you okay. gotta get out, right? <laughs> and see some things and learn from it and implement that into the projects you're doing and the things you will do, because those are the things that are gonna affect how you how you design and how you think. So that sounds like a good note to end on, Ruby. Yes, it is there. So if there are no other questions, mm -hmm. then I think we'll end there. But uh, thank you again, Steve, for for coming and hope everyone found this exciting and um, tune in next time. I will plug that on May 18th. Um, you may have seen that, Steve. I'll, I'll send you that. That uh, a day, Zay, a day is going to be our presenter. She is the design principal of HOK, and she will be presenting on Wednesday, May 18th, same time. So it should be another exciting one because, again, I've asked her to talk about not only her architectural path, but she's also been heavily involved in the interior design on the project she's done. So yet again, more of architects moving in in multiple pieces of the built environment space. So be on the lookout for that, folks. And Ruben, I thanks for putting this together. And Stephen, again, thank you very much for joining us tonight. You are amazing. There we go. See y'all.
See y'all we'll next time. We'll see you all next time. All right, everybody. Have a good one. Okay, thanks all right. Time.